Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Murders of Drag. I know, I'm still here. Isn't that crazy? Um, this is episode 14, which is like two full weeks episodes right there. Listen, that's an accomplishment. We're accomplished. We're happy about it. Last week's episode, hmm, let me sit back. I noticed some quirks. My camera angle was off. And bear with me, I'm still using a phone camera, but this should be the last video that you see on a camera like this. But I'm not saying the camera quality is bad, I'm just saying it could be better. And I have it rigged up on some stand right now. It's not, that's not ideal. We're not in the ideal position. This week's episode and all episodes for the foreseeable future are going to revolve around the murder of black queer people in our community. It is really important to bring these stories to the spotlight right now, bring them to the foreground. And after knocking out last week's video and sharing Kevin's story with everybody, I want to dedicate this channel to be a place where I can amplify those stories and use my platform as a place that I can do important things, do what's right. and do what's important for my community and the people that I love. And call out injustice where I see it and do something about it as much as I can. So for this week's case, I'm going to be discussing the murder of Mark Carson back in 2013 in Greenwich Village, New York. Mark Carson was born in 1981 in New York. Um, he attended Legacy High School and graduated around 1998. Um, these dates are approximate because I read a lot that Mark was private about his life, but didn't realize just how private private meant. I respect that 100%, but it did make it a little bit difficult for me to find exact dates. After he graduated high school in or around 98, he went on to attend the Borough of Manhattan's Community College to further his education there. Mark's aunt, Florence Boopers, or <laughs> Buppers? I like to think Boopers, because I like that last name. She remarked that his family was always very accepting of Mark's sexuality. Mark was a gay man. And she's quoted saying that their family's general attitude towards it was that family is family no matter what, which I thought was very touching. Because you don't really see that in a whole lot of families. You're fortunate if your family feels that way. As I said, Mark wasn't really the type of person that wanted to share a whole lot about his personal life with very many people, if anybody at all. Many people close to him didn't know much more than that Mark would go on dates. They described them as little dates here and there. Now, no serious relationships really in his life that he was public about or that he'd let anybody know about. Um, again, I really relate to that and I respect that. I entirely respect that. Although Mark was a private person, he by no means was an anti-social person. He actually loved going out in Greenwich Village, which was, Greenwich Village um, is the gay community in New York City. Kind of how P-Town would be the gay community in Boston. Um, that's Greenwich Village to New York City. One of the sort of recurring themes that I found among the memories that uh, Mark's friends had of him was that they all shared their first experience out in gay nightlife and gay culture with Mark, meaning that he would sort of show all of his friends the gay nightlife and bring them out in their first experience of gay culture. Because kind of like I was talking about in my last episode, it's really overwhelming your first time that you step out into the gay nightlife scene or into the like active gay culture scene, because there's a lot of there's just a lot going on and you need to kind of find where you fit in in all of it. And Mark was kind of the leader that would bring people into that. And he was confident enough in the scene that he had been frequenting since high school that he knew he could show his friends that area. His younger gay friends who would, were new to coming out or who were new to the gay scene would all go to Mark to show them around Greenwich Village. Back when Mark was in high school, um, on his weekend evenings, he would frequent the um, the Christopher Street Piers in Greenwich Village and he'd bring friends with him. And he would also go often to the Harvey Milk High School's after school program that was dedicated to helping LGBTQ youth. One of Mark's teenage best friends who is a radio personality now named Alonzo um, actually 
recalled a memory where Mark brought him to Greenwich Village and is quoted saying, he introduced me to the whole gay culture, which is a really big thing that you can do for one of your gay friends. Mark was definitely not afraid ever to be himself under any circumstances. He was described as being very fabulous with the clothes that he wore and really just not giving a what people thought about him. But he was also not somebody that you could walk over. If you did have something negative to say about him, he would call you out and he would ask you why why you felt that way and why you had something to say to him about him being happy and living his life the way that he wanted to. Before I really get into more of this story, I want to stress just how important this area is. Greenwich Village is very important to LGBT people, um, especially LGBT people from New York, because it's considered one of the birthplaces of the gay rights movement, the LGBT rights movement, because um, in Greenwich Village is Stonewall that I covered a few episodes ago. And if you don't know, Reader's Digest version is the Stonewall riots were mainly transgender black women rioting against police brutality in their gay bars. And those riots lasted about three nights and it sparked national attention, media attention, and really got the ball rolling for LGBT rights. The village is also, um, just historically an LGBT friendly neighborhood. Um, LGBT people have always lived in the village and have always kind of called it home. They've been able to walk out in the street and hold their significant other's hand without being afraid of being beaten to death or arrested or, you know, the plethora of things that can happen to an LGBT individual for just living their life unapologetically and out of hiding. So the village was kind of the place, it was the village where you could be yourself. It was, you know, it's the village. So that's kind of why Greenwich Village is so important. The Reader's Digest version of why Greenwich Village is so important to the LGBT community. And I wanted to emphasize that you'll see why in a few minutes. This story begins fairly early in the evening, especially fairly early in the evening for Greenwich Village and the gay community. We like to stay up late. Um, on May 17th, 2013, after working another one of his notoriously long shifts as the manager of a frozen yogurt kiosk in the prime location of Grand Central Terminal, he was probably so freaking busy all the time. Mark went out to the village for a night out to celebrate the weekend and brought his friend Danny Robinson along. Early on in the evening, around 11.30, Danny and Mark are walking around Greenwich Village getting kind of close to the bar that they want to get to, uh, when, meanwhile, Elliot Morales is at Anissa on 6th Avenue. Elliot comes walking by the front window of the restaurant and decides to stop and start urinating on the front window. Elliot is a generally shady character already. He's been to prison for attempted murder. Um, he's got a pretty long rap sheet, and he's just never proven at any point in his life that he wants to be a good stand-up guy. And this night's not unlike most of his other nights. He was belligerently drunk walking around, um, just trying to cause as much trouble as he possibly could and just be a d in general. When the owner finally came out of the restaurant and told him that he needed to get the hell out of there, um, he got combative and started hurling gay slurs at the staff at the restaurant, the patrons at the restaurant, bartenders, the owner, um, and causing a problem. It's I think that's what he wanted out of it all, honestly, because he was saying while he was in there, did you see what I was doing? And he taunted them and told them to call the police, among calling them a lot of names that I don't like to say. While the staff was arguing with him, as things started to escalate, he escalate, escalate, he lifted up his gray hoodie and brandished his silver pistol in his waistband, sort of non-verbally threatening them with his gun. Move. Just around then, Mark and Danny come walking around the corner and walk into the scene not knowing anything about what's going on when Elliot immediately turns to them. And like I said, Mark liked to dress the way that he dressed. He was a gay man. He dressed fabulously. His shoes were always fantastic. His outfits were always fantastic. He was 100% on point all the time. When Elliot saw the men, he said, look at these They look like gay wrestlers, which is probably the dumbest insult that I've ever heard. 
but disrespectful nonetheless. Like I said, Mark didn't take from anybody and also had no idea about the danger of the situation that he had just walked into. His friend Danny was no exception either. He wasn't going to take I mean, and nobody should ever take be disrespected like that. So Mark and Danny turn around and ask him, what did you just say? And are returned with silence as he kind of drunkenly and stupidly just gives them that kind of stare. Allegedly, Elliot was also with a friend that night, so he wasn't alone either, the homophobe in the situation. And without saying anything, they began to follow Mark and his friend Danny. Greenwich Village is a very popular area, especially this was a Friday night, especially on the weekends, and people were around to witness every single event that happened. So these, these are eyewitness events that are brought to piece together this story. One of those witnesses allegedly heard um, Elliot's friend say to him, are you sure you want to do this? In which case that could provide evidence for premeditated first degree murder, but that evidence is substantial because it's hearsay. Not substantial, circumstantial. That's how you know I'm not a lawyer. While the pair was following Mark and his friend Danny, uh, witnesses heard Elliot and his friends screaming slurs and yelling queer and fag and all these other things at them while they were behind them, taunting them and trying to provoke them. Eventually, Elliot and his little accomplice there stopped Mark and Danny on the corner of West 8th Street across the street from Gray's Papaya in the village. At this point, Elliot directed his attention right to Mark for some reason and asked him, do you want to die here? And at this point, more people are paying attention so the eyewitness accounts start to get more and more detailed. Danny and witnesses then confirm that Elliot asked Mark, are you with him? gesturing to Danny, to which Mark responded, yes. This is the point that Elliot Morales pulls out his silver pistol and shoots Mark directly in the face at point blank range, killing him instantly. Elliot ran towards the intersection of McDougal and West 3rd Street, where cops apprehended him. There was a bit of a struggle, but they eventually got him and they got his gun, arrested him and charged him right then and there with murder. When news broke early that Saturday morning, people were absolutely outraged because Mark's death marked the 22nd act of violence against somebody for being gay in that city in that year. Despite all of the witnesses that saw everything that happened that night, despite the video footage from cell phones and CCTV, um, Elliot still decided that he was going to plead that he murdered Mark with a gun, shooting him in the face at point blank range in self-defense. Elliot also made the decision for some reason to represent himself, which means that he's going to be the one that examines all of the witnesses, including the person that he murdered his best friend in front of. In court, as Elliot described the events of that night, with very little remorse in his voice and just this sort of sense of vindication that he'd been wronged and he was gonna right that wrong in court and this was gonna be his, for lack of a better term, day in court. Elliot described that he never actually saw the wound that he inflicted onto Mark, but he saw the trickle of blood underneath Mark's head growing bigger into a pool and that's when he ran away. You don't murder somebody out of self-defense and then describe that moment with that arrogant just this is what happened fact is fact i don't feel bad about it it was self-defense that's not you're not sorry first of all and you weren't defending yourself against anything one of his main defenses for himself is that it couldn't have been a hate crime because he himself was not straight reason being he had relations with a transgender woman which makes you still straight because that's still a woman and he even brought her into court as if being a murderer wasn't bad enough he had to also add insult to injury and claim that disgusting transphobe on that uh resume as well so i really as i researched this case didn't think that this guy elliot could get worse than he was and um i was very wrong 
When Elliot's friend, Danny Robinson, took the stand to testify and get his friend that he watched be murdered justice, um, Elliot had the nerve- Wait, if I just said Elliot's friend, then I mean Mark's friend. But Elliot asked Danny questions on the stand, such as, Is it possible that what happened was a reaction to the threat that was put on my own life when you followed me around a corner? Oh, and another one that's not even a question. You could have avoided all of this from escalating to the level it did if you and Mr. Carson just went along with your own business. Which, again, isn't even a question, just straight victim blaming and proving to the jury, the court, anybody who's paying attention how of a person you are. It just blows my mind. Obviously, his incredibly inappropriate questions were objected and thrown out by the judge and the lawyers that were present during the trial. One of the prosecutors made a great point during the trial about um, the fact that it was a hate crime when they said this was a hate crime simply when Elliot started throwing slurs because when you dehumanize a person like that, you're already working in your head to make this person not human. So when you hurt them or kill them, you don't have to carry that guilt as badly. And you've you've dehumanized them and you've put them at this point where you can just get rid of them inconsequentially. His audacity to ask those insulting and inappropriate questions to Danny really blows my mind, especially coming from somebody who made comments just hours after he killed somebody like, guy thought he was tough in front of his bitch, so I shot him, and diagnosis is dead, doctor. Heartless comments about the person that you just took a life from. That right there shows no remorse and proves that it wasn't self-defense. After closing statements, it didn't take very long at all for the jury to come to the consensus that Elliot was guilty on all charges. And then the minimum sentence for that crime carries a 20 to life. I'm incredibly glad that Mark Carson got his justice, but I can't help but feel scared, frustrated, and everything in between at the fact that if Mark, a black man, wasn't killed by somebody as downright dumb as Elliot, who really painted himself into this guilty picture, I'm just not sure that he would have ever gotten justice. After the trial, Mark's aunt, Florence, was quoted saying, I feel like I got justice for my nephew. Even if I don't feel like it's enough, it'll have to be enough. It's closure. It's clear to me that Mark will be remembered well by his friends, family, and community, and it's clear to me that Mark will carry that description of a proud and fabulous gay man for long and long and long after he's been gone. Mark actually gave himself the nickname Envy, and his reasoning behind that was because he said every time he walked into a room, everybody in the room envied him, envied his energy, and envied the fact that he was so friggin' fabulous. And although this case itself is very tragic, I think that's that's a common feeling that I had reading a lot of, of what people had to say about Mark, was hope, a lot of hope. So that was the case and murder and life of Mark Carson. I know this case wasn't exactly the prime example of what we're currently focusing on within the Black Lives Matter movement, but it is a good example of why it's important to remember the Black lives that we've lost and say their names and tell their stories, because these stories deserve to be told. Somebody as fabulous as Mark deserves a fabulous story, a story to be told in a fabulous way. I am going to put on some Nick Snacks, Lashes, and a wig, cue that transformation, and tell you guys all about next week's episode. And that's the look for this week. Yes, I'm so happy that I didn't forget these this time. So next week is going to go largely the same as this week, except this time, midway through the week, I'm going to post little teasers about what this episode's gonna be, what the makeup look might look like, and some other little updates during the week. I wanna become a little bit more active on social media than I have been in the past. These lashes are heavy, my heart is light, my debt is plenty. 
and I will see you guys next week. Mwah.